noticed that um, talking today about disasters and social connection would be a bit left of field, but it was mentioned sort of three or four times already today. So I'm feeling like we're right on track, <laughs> which is great. Um, I will be talking about um, disaster resilience um, and how uh, it relates to social connection, how the two are interconnected. Um, I'm going to start by giving a bit of an overview about our work in disaster resilience and community level disaster resilience, um, and then a bit about the tool that we've been um, working with Swinburne on improving, um, and then uh, a little bit about what you can do to um, help your communities be more resilient to disasters. Um, okay, so Australian Red Cross um, works in the uh, psychosocial space when it comes to disasters, so the psychosocial um, it, elements of disasters, both um, before, during and after disasters. Um, it's not often a, a super valued area in terms of talk, when we talk about disasters, a psychosocial preparedness, response and recovery, but it's hugely important, um, as important or more important um, than the kind of physical implications of disasters. Just to kind of preface um, a bit about why we think it's really important to talk about disaster resilience, um, just a, a slide here about the compounding disasters that we've had um, over the last few years and why we believe we're seeing a real change in the discussion um, and the kind of increasing value being placed on disaster resilience. And I don't need to tell many of you this, but um, this is just some of the things that Australian communities have been experiencing um, in the last few years. We know that disasters are becoming more intense um, more frequent and more severe. We, um, the, the CEO of Australian Red Cross says often that our emergency services teams used to have time to heal and rest and recover, um, our staff and our volunteers, our huge volunteer workforce, um, between disasters. And there was sort of this real sense of before disaster, during disaster and after disaster. Um, and that just doesn't happen anymore. We're kind of rolling in response from one disaster to the next. Australian Red Cross is all hazards. So it's not just um, fires and floods. We respond um, to collective trauma incidents um, and all sorts of individual events as well. So um, that's kind of adding for, for our work and our people on the compounding effect of these disasters um, and important to set the scene. So our work in disaster resilience, um, we sort of target a few levels. We have individual um, disaster resilience programs and offerings, and that's sort of around um, preparing your household and preparing yourself and, and your important people for disasters. So that might be um, things like workshops in schools, preparing school children um, for disasters, um, workshops with, with individuals um, preparing their household emergency plan. We have a, a award-winning um, emergency plan called Ready Plan, a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, so that's sort of our individual and household focus. But what I'm more keen to talk to you about is our community-level um, approach to disaster resilience. So over the last few years, we had quite a few different community level programs popping up. Um, we had community level disaster resilience happening in, in New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania, um, Queensland, and the need and the desire for these programs was really increasing pretty rapidly. And we saw this need to, to kind of pull the learnings from all of them together, and make sure we had a nationally consistent um, program based on evidence of what was working really well in all of those um, examples. So we ended up with this approach to community level disaster resilience, um, which involves these sort of three key areas. Um, Ready Communities is the name of the workshops that we deliver, and, and I believe we might have delivered Ready Communities workshops in some of the council areas that you work in, so some of you might be quite familiar with this. So I just want to touch here um, really importantly, I think, on the scoping and engaging element um, of this whole process of engaging communities um, in disaster resilience work. This is a real challenge that we face in terms of um, I guess, communicating what we're trying to do, but funding and reporting on what we're doing in this space as well, um, because this process is about us becoming connected with community or if we're already embedding um, embedded in the community through other, you know, volunteer and, um, and other programs that we run. It's about strengthening those relationships and making sure that we have... Um, good connections to base our work off. We know that if we take time beforehand to build connection, um, the outcomes of these um, processes alongside community are vastly different. And so this process takes sort of six to eight months in a community where we don't already have a presence to really build connection, become embedded and, and be a meaningful part of that community to be able to go on this whole process alongside community. Um, 
which is not easy to put in like a funding pitch or to, to report on. And I'm sure some of you are having the same challenge um, with your work. Um, so this process, the scope and engage um, is the first bit. I don't know how to stop that from happening. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the workshops are the next bit. So we work um, alongside communities. We facilitate these workshops um, to work with communities to help them assess their own risk and strengths in terms of disasters, um, to develop local teams, um, or a team on disaster resilience to prioritise the actions um, and deliver actions that they think they would like to undertake um, towards disaster resilience and then to measure pro progress um, and to, to grow impact from there. So I guess a bit of what does it usually look like when we're going through this process or what comes out the other side? Um, it's as varied as the number of communities that we go into. Essentially, it's completely community-led um, it's really a facilitation process. We're not delivering content necessarily. So the ideas that community members come up with um, are sometimes really surprising and we are there to facilitate the process and kind of support them and go on the journey with them. So it can be anything from um, one community held a disaster resilience fair and where they got 400 community members to come and participate in this fair. Um, other communities have focused on things like um, creating food security groups um, other communities have done pottery classes, community dinners, things like that. And I guess um, it's nice to be in a room full of people with this kind of focus, but usually we have to explain um, quite clearly and can be quite difficult to explain what the link is between a community dinner and disaster resilience. And obviously it's social connection. Um, so I just, there's one story I want to highlight um, about this, which is a, a story of the uh, researcher David Aldrich, who travelled to Japan um, five years after the Fukushima nuclear um, meltdown. And um, they were finding that disaster obviously was a compounding disaster. It was an earthquake, and then a tsunami, and then a nuclear meltdown. Um, and they were kind of observing that communities were recovering at really different paces and, and having a really different experience to each other quite close by in terms of their disaster recovery. Um, and they wanted to figure out why. So they looked at um, various things. There was a theory that it was based on the wealth of the community beforehand. Um, it wasn't that. <laughs> they looked at um, potentially the height of the wave of the tsunami in different areas, thinking that it might have been that. Um, and in the end, just had to take a really broad look of all sorts of indicators that they had access to in terms of the information um, and found that it was connectedness. It was community connectedness. So communities that had things like walking groups and book clubs um, and reported better connectedness were recovering better five years after this compounding disaster experience. This is just a, a quote um, from one of the pilot community groups where we ran the Ready Communities workshops in Tasmania, actually. Um, people sort of reflecting who had experienced um, a bushfire after being through the workshops um, and just commenting on um, because they'd had the collective sessions as, as a community, they were quite calm um, and the panic that they'd experienced in previous bushfires um, that they'd been through was, was notably less there after going through the workshops. Um, Jane touched on this um, community resilience assessment tool that um, Swinburne and Jane and her team have been helping us um, with, which we're really excited about. Um, so the community resilience assessment tool is a tool um, that we developed um, based on these four resilience capacities um, that we know when strengthened um, impact a community's ability to recover from a disaster, respond to and recover from a disaster. Um, so it's a self-assessment tool, really. It's not our assessment. It's for communities to use themselves. We just facilitate the process um, for them to kind of reflect on um, how they're, you know, rating themselves against these resilience capacities. So this is what um, we've been working with Swinburne and Swinburne have been um, working on helping us sort of refine and improve this tool um, alongside communities giving us feedback, which has been really fantastic um, and we're quite excited about that. Um, so this is the process that we use to run the resilience tool in these workshops and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. It's a, it's a participatory process, so we get a group of um, community members in the room. That group for the Ready Communities workshops is as um, representative of a community as we can possibly get, which you will all know has its real challenges, um, but usually also has people from hazard agencies and council um, represented in that group as well. So they, they work to these 
indicators and they have to kind of rate themselves against the indicators of where they think they sit. Um, the things I just want to highlight are these assumptions, um, unpacking assumptions as part of this um, assessment exercise that the community group goes to goes through are really, um, it's pretty amazing to see and it's it's more often than not the other way around, I think, than you would assume. It's often people from hazard agencies needing to test their own assumptions about, well, we, we think the community are completely across what is a hazard, what hazards might affect them or, um, you know, what do we mean by heat wave or it might be things like that. And often the assumptions are being tested that way um, and through the discussion process, um, the results that they end up with that inform their decision-making in terms of what actions they're going to take are actually really different from where those conversations start earlier in the facilitation process. Um, so just in terms of our link with this um, Activating Social Connection um, project, um, the, the big thing that we're um, really excited about is the improvement and the um, refining of this assessment tool. But there's other things um, that we're also really interested in informing our work and having access to this um, incredible research and collective knowledge. Um, some of them are the things that Jane um, shared earlier. So things like understanding social connection personas, um, enablers and barriers. You know, obviously we understand that social connection underpins disaster resilience. So better understanding these things is going to inform our work and we're really excited about that. The other thing is how we measure um, our work in terms of social connection, which has been really challenging for us to figure out. And I'm really excited to see on the agenda for later um, in the day a bit about measuring social connection. So that's something we're really interested to be a part of. Um, the other thing maybe just to mention is on the um, resilience assessment tool, we're really interested in the sort of next phase of this process with um, the Swinburne team is to see if actually a community's awareness of their social connection and the process of testing their, their social connection together might have an impact on social connection um, or actions that they take out of that. Um, um, for time, I'm going to skip this story. <laughs> just another story. Um, I just want to leave you with um, what can you do in terms of disaster resilience. Um, I would encourage any... Um, community organisational council groups in the room to consider um, asking us to facilitate ready communities workshops. Um, the feedback we have so far from councils on us facilitating ready communities is that um, actually having a kind of impartial and outside um, organisation, staff and volunteers facilitating these workshops makes a huge difference to how people approach the workshops and what they can come out with and having the council um, as participants in a part of the community and part of that process rather than leading it um, has been really valuable for councils and community members um, in feedback so far. Um, you can do individual preparedness actions for disasters. So you can look up ready plan and complete your emergency plan um, or download the Get Prepared app and do it that way. Um, and then the other things are um, things we've already touched on this morning, but um, look for ways to build social connectedness in your community um, uh, and think about, you know, what would make your community resilient to climate change uh, as well as part of that process. Um, I really liked the Christmas drinks idea. so um, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> um, the last thing I just want to leave you with is to point out that um, it's not always a straight line between disaster resilience and resilience um, activities, as most of you know. Um, I saw in the toilets earlier, there's like four steps of how to prepare for emergencies and helpful little videos there. And I would just encourage um, anyone working in this space to think as well about the social connection actions and activities they can support communities with as equally important, if not more important to disaster resilience um, as those sort of more concrete, practical um, preparedness activities. Thanks very much. Over to you and your name, please. And uh... Thank you. My name is Mandy. I've got a quick question about the disaster that you talked about, the compounded disaster. Was the connection happening, were people participating prior or was it participation post? It was primarily before. Um, so communities that had um, those activities around social connection happening before the disaster. Um, and then I think in a lot of cases kept them going. Yeah. Um, the, for your research that you're doing now, the activation of participation post um, major disasters, that that then also helps 
create better social connection, which then results in better resilience and outcomes for the community. It's it's a cycle that we used to be able to say really clearly, this is disaster resilience work that we do and this is disaster recovery work that we do and that just doesn't happen so much anymore. There are, um, and a lot of communities, um, Australian Red Cross has had more of a disaster recovery presence in the last probably five years than resilience, but those communities where we're still embedded, we're still in the long term, which is, you know, really central to the work that we do and we really strongly believe is is kind of non-negotiable. Um, those communities now sort of three years post bushfire are starting to ask, ask us to facilitate resilience um, activities as well. But, yeah, a lot of what we do in disaster recovery are hosting community dinners or taking, I guess, some of that um, like organising off people who are already time poor and, you know, busy and coping with the impacts of disaster. So so we kind of take that role of facilitating community connection activities. Yeah. Thank you. And the person at the front here. G'day. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Jane, in terms of your research, did you look at the potential of education spaces informing these social connections? And I mean that both in short term and long term, because I think you can trace a lot of these issues we have with social connection to our education system and how people are essentially taught from a very young age to think of themselves only as individuals and how if you if you construct education spaces with young children in, in small groups, they're really getting that social part of education that we often miss out of and it also provides an opportunity for the parents of those children to form a more immediate social connection? Great question. Um, we didn't look specifically at education spaces, but, I mean, one of the things that we know about learning activities is that they are excellent for social connection because they bring diverse people together. And so that's like what they were saying about the dog parks this morning, um, that you know it's that's one of the things we need more in our society right because we have so many dividing things that happen in society um also when we did the research uh out in the in the suburbs uh, a lot of people talked about learning activities as something they really wanted to do anyway so social connection as a byproduct is something we often talk about um and they had some brilliant ideas about you know different activities and different things that they wanted to do I I do look I kind of share your <laughs> I think individualism is like it's just everywhere in our society and I wanted Andrew to speak more about <laughs> about you know getting away from that earlier this morning I, I I really think that you know you go you drive past schools and they say you know achieve um resi be resilient blah and I think oh <laughs> that's a lot of pressure um and maybe yeah maybe connection would be it would be a a good kind of thing to have so not specifically but I think absolutely and you know I think also people talked a lot about libraries and how they felt they felt it was neutral ground where they were allowed to go because because some people live quite surveilled lives, right? Um, so it's just kind of building in all of these realisms of people's lives. And um, and I think that's what's one of the interesting things about the research is actually kind of finding all these things out and going, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, sorry, didn't answer your question specifically, but. Any other questions? Yes, one down at the back. And also any online, please do put your hand up as well. In your Hi, name, please. hello. Hi, my name's Ramona. I'm from Bridge Darabin, which is um, Preston and Thornbury Neighbourhood House. So uh, shout out to Neighbourhood Houses. Um, I just wanted to ask um, either of you about um, the research and the role of small, really small grassroots organisations like neighbourhood houses. Um, there's more neighbourhood houses in Australia than there are McDonald's. So I think it's really significant. So, yeah, shout out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you could speak to that and that part of the research. Yeah, um, I will let Jane speak to the research, but I can, I can talk to how important we find neighbourhood houses to be in the Ready Communities workshops and the community-level work that we do. Um, Often um, 
community uh, neighborhood houses are the first to sign up to the workshops. And once the neighborhood house signs up to come to the workshop, other small organizations in a community or local businesses will kind of take their lead and come along as well. Um, and we've also found that neighborhood houses are playing a really big role where we've run workshops um, and we don't have an ongoing presence in community. Neighborhood houses are um, increasingly the ones that take on that responsibility of kind of convening the group and having a um, a physical safe um, space for everyone to be um, and to keep that going. So we're we're very aware of the importance of neighbourhood houses and very grateful um, for all of the work that neighbourhood houses do in supporting our work as well. But I'll let Jane talk to the research. Yeah, uh, look, we, I guess, um, have worked a lot with neighbourhood houses in the past. I think they're totally awesome and amazing. And uh, we, in this research, I guess, um, community hubs were mentioned more. Um, I'm not sure maybe the council people could could speak to this or Tracy, my colleague. Um, I'm not, I think maybe there are more community hub type things going on in the outer metro suburbs, but perhaps there are also neighborhood houses. Um, they were not specifically raised by uh, our people, but obviously all of these initiatives that are out there doing that incredible grassroots work are super important and form a kind of web or fabric of connection across the community and the in the kind of absence of a more um, joined up sort of top down almost policy kind of ideological space like it almost feels like it almost feels like all of these community initiatives and red cross and all of the red cross members and everything it's like they're trying to provide you know that web but without but with almost like a policy and kind of ideal ideology sort of push back um so you know i think that makes it even more challenging um and i guess i just hope that you get you know you keep getting funding and so on because again that's another thing for uh, community organizations is it's keeping the people going to run it but also the funding and one of the things we are doing in the project is about measurement and i think that if we can develop these kind of measurement frameworks that are actually attached to evidence and theory, then they can be used widely by community organizations and different organizations can show how they contribute to social connection through using these kind of measurement frameworks that, that you know, everybody is able to share kind of thing. Because at the moment, when we spoke to people recently in a in a workshop, we we had people saying, yeah, you know, we count the number of people who come through the door. And then other people were like, yeah, you know, we do this survey and it doesn't add, doesn't necessarily add up. So um, that, you know, that's part of something we're trying to do in the project as well. That could be, that could be helpful, I hope. Over to you. Look, Caroline from the Foundation for Rural and Regional Renewal. And we also have got sort of disaster resilience programs. Uh, so, Rhiannon, I'm interested in how you select the communities that you run your Ready Communities programs in. Are you, is it by request from community or do you go select particular communities and go and offer your program? Um, it's a good question. It's a bit of a mix. Um, and it's a bit of a mix because our funding is a bit of a mix, <laughs> probably, mostly. Um, so where we have long-term recovery programs happening, so we might have funding for a three- or four-year recovery program. Um, we're already there once that community um, asks for resilience work. We'll do that in that area where we already are. Um, sometimes councils ask us to facilitate the workshops, um, and in those um, situations the council is wanting us um, usually they're asking us because there has been requests from community and they feel that they can't facilitate the process, so they ask us to. And then the, in those cases, the council sort of takes on the long-term support role to help communities actually undertake the actions that they've prioritised as part of the workshops. Um, but, yeah, we we are not uh, interested in pushing <laughs> pushing the workshops on communities that don't want them. Um, and uh, we have found, so we've got, um, thinking of one example, we've got a um, disaster resilience workshop, uh, 
project, um, two-year project happening on the east coast of Tasmania at the moment. Um, and I think the project officer there had assumed that ready communities would be a great option. That community there hasn't experienced a disaster in a really long time. There's no sort of lived experience of disaster. Um, and there really wasn't the appetite to do something like this. So um, the ask actually was more around um, us facilitating bringing hazard agencies and council and government together to do um, sort of information nights and and share with community, get community together still in the, in the same physical space, um, quite localised, small groups of sort of 50 community members um, by a local area and have discussions about what the risks are in that area and what the roles are of all the different agencies um, there. So, you know, where it's not wanted and where there's something else more appropriate, we'll just, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah. We'll take that one last question online and I yeah. think we'll be at time. I get to ask myself a question. <laughs> um, thank you to Asafe uh, from Multicultural Services Coordinator at Libraries ACT. Uh, she is wondering, she's met, picked up on the idea of libraries as neutral and safe spaces, which is great. I'm wondering if there's been any mention of any specific community development programs or plans that communities are interested of access to. So what I would say in response to that was um, a lot of different ideas came up where people said they wanted to learn more. But one of the things I guess that surprised me, but I also thought, yeah, was, you know, people talk about a lot of these things we take for granted in Australia, like Medicare. How does Medicare work? How does Centrelink work? How does the voting system work? How does government work? Um, so a lot of people ask for, you know, those kinds of um, little courses, I suppose. Um, I think the other thing that came up a lot was that idea that I mentioned when I was speaking about how people go to things, but they often go, oh, you know, what I would really like to do is talk about dreams or philosophy or mental health or whatever and so but they they can't do it themselves because they don't have the confidence or the you know it, it needs a framework around it um, and that's kind of one of the things we've been talking about with Wyndham around the human library or the um, skills and interests resource so uh, things that are short term so helping people to try out their idea short term but actually helping them to do it so they don't have to do all the effort themselves and just seeing if it catches on and um, you know maybe after a few weeks they have found some people to, who share their interests and they go off to a coffee shop and look at it uh, or it just dwindles and you know it, it was great but I couldn't find anyone who wanted to discuss Jung in in the in the vicinity so though I think those are the kinds of things that libraries might be able to help with kind of facilitating those short-term opportunities for people yeah I hope that helps that's fair thank you for the question thank you